Selamat pagi. Terima kasih banyak for coming here early in the morning after the holiday season. Uh, we're all back to work already or still a little bit holiday. <laughs> Oke, okay, saya berbicara bahasa Indonesia hanya sedikit, so saya coba uh, bahasa Belanda. Oke, okay, ya. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mix mix bahasa Inggris, Belanda dan Indonesia. <laughs> Oke, okay, ini Persekin, Perimpunan Sejarah Kedokteran Indonesia is a small group of physicians doing research and history of medicine. Prof Tario Angotta. Uh, dan Prof Tario also is is the chief of the group in Yogyakarta. So ada Nah, banyak ada orang dokter interested in history. And this is the... Okay. First, pertama, I will talk about history of psychiatry in general. So, in, in most of the Western world, before 1800, and we're talking about England, Paranchis, uh, Germania, Germany, Belanda, before 1800, mental hospitals did not really provide any treatment, but to, were basically there to lock people up who could be violent, who could disturb the social order, they were dangerous, people like this. This is an image from the Bedlam Mental Hospital in London one of the very oldest one in the world. And because madmen, the insane, could be very dangerous, they were often chained up. Now, it looks familiar, right? It's still a little bit today, unfortunately. So, conditions in these asylums were very bad. The thought was, the insane don't feel hot, don't feel cold, they don't get sick, so you do not have to treat them very well. In Philadelphia, one of the first mental hospitals, every Sunday, you could go visit, just like going to the zoo. Right? So you take the family and you see the insane in cages. If we look at this today, it's like so cruel, how could this be? Around 1800, we see a reform in psychiatry called moral treatment. What would that be, moral treatment? Therapy moral? Therapy moral, huh? This is Philippe Pinel, who was famous after the French Revolution. He went into the mental hospital, the Salpetriere, and he took all the chains off. And it turned out the insane were not all that scary. His thought was treat the insane with kindness and they will adopt kind behavior. Samuel Chuk, in England, he was a Quaker. Quaker is a small Christian group that is pacifist, uh, refused to go into the army. They do a lot in charity. And I thought we have members of our group in Bedlam that's not good, we need to find a different way. So he opened a mental hospital in the countryside, a beautiful building. During the day, all the patients would work in the kitchen, in the garden, because if you have a troubled mind and you can think the whole day, do nothing, that's really bad. So this is a new impulse to psychiatry. that provides an, 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 a very friendly type of treatment. And in the beginning, it seemed to work. And everywhere in the history of psychiatry, if there's an innovation, and people are enthusiastic, then treatment results are really good. After all, people get bored, don't pay attention to patients, then the results get bad. But this seems to work, and it changed psychiatry forever. Now, this man, you pronounce the name in, the, in, the, in real Dutch, Schroeder van der Kolk. 
Bas Hapelander. <laughs> and he said in the Netherlands, we need to change care for the mentally ill. So he proposed a change of the law in 1848. They started several, they built new mental hospitals with lots of opportunity for work, um, treatment. And then a report came in from the Dutch East Indies. That's a man colonial. And this led to a change in Indonesia. Because before 1880, care of the insane in Indonesia was not very good. Care in hospitals was not very good at all. Most people, if they were sick, tried to stay out of the hospital. Because if you go to a hospital back then, if you weren't sick, you would be sick in no time. Because people didn't know about contagion, about hygiene. So there was a proposal in 1860, let's build a modern mental hospital in Bogor. And that one opened in 1881. Yep. So the four big mental hospitals, Bogor, Lawang, Magalang, Sabang, all were built in the first part of the 20th century. Before 1900, Zaman Colonial, Medical care was for Orang Belanda. It was for Cerdado, right? In the month colonial, you need to defend your colonies against the Indonesians. So the soldier, Cerdado Penting Sekali, for colonial officials, for Orang Belanda, uh, PNS, and for traders but not for Indonesians. These are month colonial. The organization of healthcare is very different. Only care for Europeans, except, except if Orang Indonesia in prison, the Dutch are responsible for providing healthcare. Prostitution. Because Orang Belanda visit prostitutes that should not have venereal disease. Because there might be a threat to Europeans. Smallpox. Smallpox, of course, was really bad. So there were campaigns for inoculation uh, and around epidemics. Cholera, quite a bit around in colonial times. Uh, plague with the rats, right? in uh, 1913, big epidemic. And after that, insane people. Ending up in prison or an insane asylum was roughly the same, right? You had to be violent. You had to disturb the social order. The police had to pick you up. And if you were a mentally healthy criminal, just a, just a criminal, you go to prison. And if people say, hmm, uh, otak, tida bagus, what is it? Person is confused, or, then go to the mental hospital. So at this time, there is no voluntary admission. You can only get into the mental hospital by a court order. So, insane asylum is one of the first forms of healthcare available to Indonesians already in 1880. So, immopsychiatry was pioneering healthcare. Before 1880, Indonesian mentally ill often ended up in prisons because they were arrested, put in prison, and then, oh, maybe we should transfer this person to a hospital, no places or in hospitals for Indonesians, and they were in terrible state. So nobody wanted to go there. Or Pasung, Pasung was already there back then. These are pictures taken in 1920. And I mean, these pictures are very familiar, right? Because it was very much like that. This is in an article by 
Latu Meten, one of the very first Indonesian psychiatrists. Then we have a plan how to change mental health care. Two Dutch physicians make a study. They travel to the Netherlands, look at the very best mental hospitals. Then they go to Germany, to England, and they make a report about the very best mental hospitals and about mental hospitals in tropical countries. And then they recommend to build a hospital like the one in Bogor. It took another 20 years. Bureaucracy goes very slowly. They also count the number of people, the number of mentally ill in Java. They say, oh, it's about 600. So the hospital doesn't need to be too big. And in the history of psychiatry everywhere in the world, once you build a mental hospital, it fills up. You build a second mental hospital, it fills up. Then you get overcrowding. There's always more demand than there is places. So in the 1870s, they started to build the hospital in Bogor. We all have been to RSJ Marsuki Madi, yeah? Back then, it was in the countryside, in the Sawa. Today, it is in the city, right? So in 1881, it was only half finished. And then the Pemerinta Colonial said, it's Mahal Sakali, it's so expensive, let's stop building it. So they only had the wards for the men, they fixed it so they could also admit women, stopped building. And there we see a map. Does it look like this today? Yeah, a little bit. Around it, an agricultural colony. So Indonesian patients would go there during the day to work. If they were not dangerous to themselves or others, they would live there. And of course, running a mental hospital is very expensive. So if the gardens provide all the food for the patients, you save money. For the women patients, they would work in the laundry, cleaning, cooking, so at the time when it had opened, it was one of the most expensive buildings in the colonies. Much more expensive than many other mental hospitals. So many other buildings. Yes? So moral treatment, labor is therapy. Now around 1880, the plantation economy in the Dutch East Indies took off very big. Before, with the VOC, the Dutch East Indies Company, the colonies were for trading. You go with your ship, you buy lots of spices, you go back. Around 1880, the Dutch had a new idea, thinking, no, we do plantations for tobacco, for coffee, for rubber, and then we can sell that on the world market. And Indonesians were asked to work there. So at a time when Europeans thought, we need to teach Indonesians how to work, you see, work in mental hospitals. And you know, right? Zamandulu, what is it, Saman Colonial, Europeans said, oh, Indonesians are so lazy, they don't want to work. Of course, Indonesians said that Dutch people are very lazy, because Dutch people would just sit around, right, and say, work, work, work. But they themselves would drink alcohol, do nothing. So it is, just really depends how you look at it. But still, importantly, the thought was if patients learn how to work in the Sawa, if they can return home, they know they have a job. So it is a form of rehabilitation. So very early on, that was a part of mental health care. The problem is, for many patients, that the family said, no, 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 we don't want this person back because of stigma and because sometimes insane people are unpredictable and difficult to deal with. So around the Bogor Mental Hospital we see lots of people staying there for quite a long time. Here we see some pictures. 
This building is still there. Uh, this is the Pendoppo. In Bogor. No, Bogor. Bogor. And today it has uh, kacha, so it has glass and ase. Back then, no. So it looks familiar, right? Yes. This is European patients in white outfits. They're playing sports. Because European patients don't work, right? Because the status of a European in the colonies is you do not have to work. So labor therapy doesn't work. So they did sports, listen to music. Here's the Pendoppo again, every Sunday, Gamelan. Just like in Magalan, right? They have a whole Gamelan and Vayan Kulit. So again, a few. No, Bogor, <laughs> Bogor, some of the original buildings. This is the same, the Pendoppo with the uh, Gamelan, Noma Gamelan today. The rice fields, workshop. Now once the mental hospital in Bogor opened, there was lots of critique saying, this is so expensive. And in the Dutch newspapers, they said, why spend so much money on Indonesians? We should spend money on soldiers, on the army. Because what happens if Indonesians rise up? So should we spend money on the insane, on soldiers? Or... Then there was also a, a, a critique of Bogor saying, uh, the buildings are all made of stone. This is not how most Indonesian people, what they are used to. It's not their everyday life. So there was a proposal to make mental hospitals cheaper. So to make, um, what is the roof from atap and then bamboo walls and... Then we see the second mental hospital in Lawang. We all have been to Lawang. It's up in the mountains. It's close to Bromo. It's nice and cool. Foggy. <laughs> yeah. So this hospital is called after Dr. Rajiman. Yeah. Video Diningrad. We all know Dr. Rajiman. He's huh? orang doctor, then also a, a philosopher. And he was the doctor of the Sunan in Solo. It's built like a village, uh, so you can see the mountains there. I think this might be the library. And this is in the 20s, see, just the same. And the thought was, yes, because we need to put the patients to work, they had lots of rice fields, and then they thought, let's build a second asylum in the mountains. So they built one about an hour's walk away called Suku. The patients built it, then they made rice fields around. And then they built a second one, Sempo. So in the mental hospital were the patients who needed close medical supervision. And in Suku and Sempo, only the patients who were doing all right, who didn't need close supervision. They were building these buildings, then they worked in the sawas, etc. Unfortunately, they're gone right now. But if you walk into the mountains, you can see some parts of the buildings still there. During the Depression, 1930s, the economic crisis, more and more labor therapy was done to save money and to provide food for all the patients. Magalang, so finally, Magalang. Yep. Who has been to Magalang? Everybody, yes? Yes, you all know this building, right? And this is Magalang, yes? Oh. And this is a few years ago, had a look, see, same building. 
Sabang is, of course, a funny place to have a mental hospital. A pula, where it's really, really far away. And this hospital was built, we all know the story of Aceh, right? The Acehnese rise up against the Dutch. Dutch go send the army there for 40 years. And lots of massacres, lots of violence. In 1904, finally, the Acehnese give up. But they do not like the Dutch. And we see a form of amok called the Aceh murder. And today we would call it a suicide attack. So quite regularly, Achenese people would attack Dutch soldiers, knowing for sure they would not survive. They would be killed. So psychiatrists went to Aceh studying this problem. And some of them said the Achenese are very like the Madaris, right? They are prone to violence. They're all somewhat mentally ill. So they built this mental hospital on a remote island. So once you go to this island, you know for sure you are not coming to go back. You're not going to reintegrate it in your family. Another psychiatrist said, look, the Achenese are resentful of the Dutch. So it's not mental illness. They are true to their principles when they try to attack Dutch people. In the Dutch East Indies, we have four large mental hospitals, 12 clinics. There was a clinic in Solo, but I think there was one in Jogjakarta. Dr. Kresman, was there a clinic in Zaman Colonial, the Jogjakarta? I think so, yeah. I think there was. Anyway, so the clinics were for acute cases, maximum three months. But after three months, either you are sent home, recovered, or you're sent to a mental hospital. So Harto Heerjan is still operating. In many other places, it, the buildings are gone. In 1936, if you compare to the Philippines, to Vietnam, to all the other countries in Southeast Asia, the Dutch East Indies has the highest number of psychiatric beds per capita. So in some way, mental health care in Indonesia is the best in Southeast Asia. And it is a very expensive system. It ate up about 15 to 20 percent of the funds spent on health in colonial times. So today, in the health budget in Indonesia, how much goes to mental health? I think it is 1%, right? Is it? Hmm? Yeah, no, no, but the Indonesian national budget, the government budget. How much goes to healthcare? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so medicine in general, four to five percent. And out of that goes the mental health. Oh little, little. Okay. Call up Jacoby and say, gotta change. Then there was an initiative in 1936 to build a mental hospital not on state expense, but just like in the United Kingdom, there were lotteries and they had a big profit and then they would be spent on museums and on this mental hospital in Lenteng Agung, in between Jakarta and Bogor, not for treatment, only an agricultural colony. 
And you can see patients, they work during the day, this is where they have dinner in the evening. And this is the very first professor of psychiatry in Hindia Balanda, Dr. Van Wulften Palte. You can see he looks a bit scary, right? He's like... <laughs> <laughs> yes, teacher of Slamat Iman Santos. Yes. Slamat Imam Santoso started studying around 1936 in Jakarta with this man. So in 1927, the Geneeskundige Hogeschool, the medical school, opened and he was appointed there in the buildings of FKUI today at Salemba. Famous pioneering Indonesian psychiatrists. Everybody knows these names? Huh? <laughs> Orang Psychiater Terkenal. Sumeru worked in Bogor. Dr. Rajiman, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Muhammad Amir? No. Sumatra, Abdul Irsan, uh, Slamet Imam Santoso, yes, 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 yes. Then, of course, we have difficult times. We have Zaman Japan, then we have Revolusi. This is not good for mental hospitals. And it is very sad to see that the number of patients drops, 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 because so many patients die. Especially in Zaman, Japan, most patients just died. The 1950s were also very difficult politically, with enormous inflation, economic problems. So healthcare and psychiatry were not, well, they, they were not priorities. But then we see that psychiatry it started up with Slavant Imam Santoso. Praviro Harjo, yes. You know, you know the Professor Suyor, yes, yes, yes. He was larger than life, yes. He was a very strong character, I hear. And at UNER, Suyunus. So long time, Suyono, Suyunus. <laughs> In 1963, an American psychiatrist, Nathan Klein, visits Indonesia. He says, in 1963, there are 32 psychiatrists. Not very much. He goes to Bogor and says, yes, there is electroshock. And it is improvised, basically. You stick two wires in, yeah. right? And two wires. <laughs> <laughs> so, was also a bit dangerous for the doctors, yes? Not without risk. But of course, there was hardly any money, very few medications available, only for private patients if they could pay for it themselves. Still, in Bogor, no locked wards, patients could walk around Bogor, and they were still working in the fields. So this kind of therapy morale was still very much going on in Bogor. Ah, anyone heard of Kusumanto? Yes? Okay. Also a, a man with a very strong character. And he was going to medical school in the 50s and then becomes the chair of the Department of Psychiatry, but also the director of mental health, Ikemen Kess. And he says, I, he trained a whole generation of young psychiatrists. And he sent them to the Netherlands, to the United States, uh, Canada, to get training right there. Danny Tong, we all know Danny Tong, yes? He wrote a uh, biography. 
ah, this is Kusumanto. This is still there. It wasn't completely gray at the time. So I was able to interview him. Now the strategy of Kusumanto was in every province a mental hospital. And he told me in an interview, he said, why focus on mental hospitals? If you build a mental hospital, you cannot take it away. It stays there. If you have a couple of rooms in a hospital for psychotherapy, anyone can come along and say, oh, now it's for surgery and no longer for psychiatry. Still happens today, I'm afraid. Still, the focus, just like in the Dutch East Indies, was still on mental hospital, inpatient care, mostly for individuals with severe and persistent forms of mental disorder. And his ideal was, we have the mental hospitals, from there we educate general physicians. From there we can build outpatient clinics for care for individuals who do not need to be in hospital, but still need kind of treatment. And also he wanted to have a, uh, uh, a public health education, so education in schools. And he built this private hospital right from the previous slide, Dharmavangsa, private hospital, very good care, but of course one had to pay for it. But in the 80s there was Radio Dharmavangsa, so several hours a day with messages about mental health, about how to deal with life problems, so some form of public health education. 1964, probably nobody remembers Robert Rubin. Nathan Klein told Rubin, you have to go to Jakarta. He brought two suitcases with Thorazine or Logictil, an ECT machine, um, these are his pictures. This is Suharto Hirjan in 1964. So patients are busy cleaning the tiles, etc. And which it looks kind of right, doesn't it? Nice gardens. Yeah. And here we see. You recognize anyone? <laughs> no, no, next picture. This is Pakultaske Doctor and UI. Do you have pictures from that time from Jokja? Yes, I would love to see those pictures, right? Anyway, this is Didi Bachtiar Lubis as a young man, yes? <laughs> I think this is Ling Tam. And I think this is Kusumanto. Show on the next slide. Yeah, Kusumanto. Kusumanto. Ling Tam. We know Ling Tam. He moved to America Serikat in 68. He came back to Indonesia four years ago. And yes, Dr. Lubis, do you recognize anyone else? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I've asked so many people in Jakarta, they say, I don't know. Sasanto Vibisono is not in the picture because he was in San Francisco at the time. So. Now, if we look, look, look at the room here, right? This is all men and one woman. And today it's all women. <laughs> and one, two. <laughs> Psychiatry has changed. Yeah. It's mostly women today. So if you are not asking me questions in the discussion, I will ask you questions. How come, how come all of psychiatry is women today? Well, Professor Suyono Praviro Harjo. Praviro Hadikusumo. Yes, yes, yes. Because he married someone from Paku Alam and then he got 
a beautiful name. Now, Dr. Carla is in Belanda. So I sent her a WhatsApp. Do you have a picture? <laughs> and she said, I'm in Belanda, so I don't have it with me. So no picture today. But if you have a picture, then please send it to me. So I do not know very much about psychiatry in Jokja. So I would love to hear your stories, well, especially your stories. So today, about 900 psychiatrists in Indonesia. I don't know if they all practice. And Indonesia is about 240 million people, yes? Okay, Australia has 23 million people and 6,000 psychiatrists. Ah, Berbera. If there were as many psychiatrists in Indonesia as in Australia, then there would be 440 psychiatrists in Jokja alone. Can you imagine? So, because the situation in Indonesia is so different, Psychiatrists need to think very carefully, how can we provide mental health care to everybody who needs it? It's very difficult. Now, questions is, of course, funding for health care. Well, we have BPGS today, which provides some funding, makes access to mental health care easier. Organization of mental health care. BPGS says mental health care should go to primary care, to the puskesmas. Idei bagus sekali, except the doctors in the puskesmas do not know about mental illness. Masala bazaar. So they need to be trained. The problem is doctors in puskesma sibuk sekali, very busy. So, okay, these are the problems you have to solve, right? Saya hanya sejarawan, I can say this is the problem, and then I can say to you, okay, now solve it, okay? So, I would say psychiatry in Indonesia was off to a great start in the Dutch East Indies with excellent institutions, clinics, occupational therapy and rehabilitation. And the debate at the time was do we provide excellent care but only to a few patients or okay care but for many more patients. And I think that debate is still there. If you want to reach more people who need care, you cannot provide the very best of care. But that is still better than no care at all. And I think back then, as in today, there was a shortage of institutions, a shortage of psychiatrists, mental health nurses. Well, there were no psychologists in Zaman Colonial, but there are today. So, strategies, I think. First of all, medical education. All doctors should know about mental illness and mental health. Not just psychiatrists, all doctors. Because most people go to the puskesmas first, or to a general doctor, and a general doctor needs to be able to recognize mental illness. And depression, for example, is a big problem, because general doctors don't recognize it. And specifically in Asia, most people with depression, they don't say, I feel blue, I feel guilty. No, they say, pussing, back pain, headache, cannot sleep. So the doctor says, I'll give you some sleeping aid. Or, but that doesn't work, of course. Psychiatric nurses. If there are only 900 psychiatrists, psychiatrists got to delegate some of their work to others, to psychologists, to psychiatric nurses, to psychiatric social workers. Today we see in Indonesia that lay people are getting involved, the patient movements. We have KPSI, Communitas Peduli Schizophrenia Indonesia. They started in Jakarta, but they're also very active in Jogja. And they provide training for carers, they provide activities for patients. This is all stuff that doctors just don't have time for. And it is very important to provide that support. 
And what is it? Dr. Tika Presatiawati has been working with KPSE to develop training modules. And I think that's excellent work. Now, one other problem is mental health literacy. People in Indonesia in general do not know so much about mental illness. Has Oprah Winfrey been on television here? We know Oprah Winfrey. So she had her show on TV and people can talk about their personal challenges. We need to have an Indonesian Oprah Winfrey. Or maybe you all should write Sinetron uh, with people getting depressed and then getting treatment. Yes, you can do it. You already have an idea, I can see. <laughs> and of course, people living in the cities, in Jakarta and Jogjakarta, they know a bit more about mental illness. But if we talk about the countryside, if we talk about Eastern Indonesia, it is a long way to a mental hospital, sometimes even to Puskesmas, and people just don't know. There's a lot of stigma against mental illness. People don't recognize it as a disease. If you don't recognize it as a disease, you don't go to a doctor. So all kind of attempts to reduce stigma are very important, even though it is not so easy to think how this can be done. 